a wonderful story to tell and an incredible talent that she has to offer. I'm sure some of you have seen some of her photographs and she'll be talking more about that. Basically, Jaya transformed herself. She was a domestic worker for 10 years, just like her mother, and she had a dream. And she made it happen. And one, one of the things that she said in the one of the videos I saw of her that touched me is that she said, some people said that, oh, you're just a novelty because you're just a domestic worker and people just, and she said, watch me. That's all she said. And I thought, if more women would have that sort of vision, saying, you know what? In face of challenge, I have my dream and I'll do it, then our country would be really in a better place. So I think that that is the spirit that For the Women Foundation is trying to uh, encourage. And of course, Jaime, uh, who has so graciously agreed to be our moderator today, I, I, uh, we're, we're hoping this is just the beginning. And then, uh, I think Jaime, uh, I was so grateful for his support, and Lizzie's as well, because she's helping us with the FTW Foundation. But basically, Jaime loves, as a student of life, aside from all his corporate responsibilities, which all of you already know about. I, I don't know if all of you know that he's an avid reader and a student of life, and I was very interested in this story because it's a story of human triumph, and I think that that's what he wants to explore. So without uh, going on anymore, I, I'd like to introduce Jaja Cruz Bakani in, his, in her conversation with Jaime. Well, good evening to everyone. First and foremost, an apology. Everybody came up to me saying, Oh, but I thought it was your father who was going to be one of the least of the After it happened ten times, I thought I'd just give a general apology. Uh, and I will tell my father that he sorely missed that community. But, uh, but thank you, Kara. Thank you, Lizzie, uh, for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. I had the very good fortune uh, to spend a little time with Saiza before coming here. It was a conversation that started. And I had to break it up because it was just going on and on and, and Saiza's story is, is so extraordinary and, and her points of view are so interesting that it just could have continued. I said, we better stop so we can share this Saiza uh, with everybody else. But let me just start with a little bit of a formal uh, component, which is really uh, the recognition that Saiza uh, has received because I want her to be the one to tell you uh, her own life story. But uh, Saiza was born in 1987. Embarrassingly, that's the year I got married to Lizzie. You know, so <laughs> That's the generational difference between us. But um, as, as Tara pointed out, she's a photographer and a documentary photographer, um, massively recognized now. And uh, she's one of the Magnum Foundation's human rights fellows. So since I looked up the Magnum Foundation, and uh, the main purpose of the Magnum Foundation is expanding creativity and diversity in documentary uh, photography, and uh, with a push of the long-form visual storytelling. Um, so I looked up the president as well, Susan Maiselas, and uh, quite an extraordinary person. Uh, she's a MacArthur Fellow, uh, uh, Robert Coppa, uh, Kappa Gold Medalist, and many, many other things. And this is the kind of environment and the kind of people that have picked uh, Saiza out uh, for, for uh, what she has done. She's been recognized in, in numerous areas. She's one of BBC's 100 Women of the World uh, back in 2015. 30 under 30 women photographers 2016, Forbes 30 under 30 age of 2016. She's a Fuji film ambassador. Um, the list goes on. She's recipient of grants from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, uh, WMA Commission of 2017, and she's part of the Open Society Foundation's Moving Walls as well. Um, Saiza's uh, career has just uh, taken off. Uh, uh, her artistic endeavors have been recognized. And um, back in, moving on to 2015, Saiza won the prestigious Magnum Foundation's Human Rights Scholarship to New York University and, uh, and covered her enrollment at the Tisch School for, for Arts, uh, where she took a six-week photography uh, course. Um, so we thought we'd divide up, I had a, a chance to talk to Saiza uh, before coming in, and we thought we'd divide up uh, today's dialogue into two parts. One is a little bit about her life, uh, which is fascinating in her own points of view, and then the second half will be, if it's okay, Saiza, a little bit about your photography, and you can tell us a little bit how it came about. But the first question Isabel and I want to know, Saiza, is how did you get the name Saiza? I mean, how did that come about? <laughs> Filipinos have a penchant for unusual nicknames, but this one is very unusual, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. So I had two creative 
parents who were part of this indigenous groups in the Vizcaya. It's disappearing now, it's called the Isinais. So we have our own dialect. So my parents are very creative on naming their children in such a way that they named my sister Sharila in, in our local dialect. It means same old shit. <laughs> This indigenous uh, grouping, the size of uh, how big a group is it? How many people are left? Uh, frankly, I think you told me I've not heard of uh, this group. Anymore. So there's only 12,000 of us left in the country. So uh, the culture is disappearing. I'm the last one in our, the last generation who can speak and understand the language, unfortunately. That's amazing. And I think one interesting component of our culture in the Philippines is how many groupings like this exist now as we move. Uh, of course, English is part and parcel of our culture, but of course, we've got Tagalog and the major uh, languages, but these smaller indigenous groupings uh, uh, are beginning to disappear. And I was fascinated when we were chatting, uh, size of it, you were saying that at some point, when you have a little time, you'd like to find some ways of preserving, uh, I guess, what's left. And so, what an interesting component as well of our culture, uh, these groupings that continue to exist. But um, I looked through, uh, size of some of your, uh, your interviews on YouTube before coming here. And there was one that struck me, and I was wondering if maybe we could use it as a way to take off and to talk a little bit about your, your youth and how you picked up photography. You mentioned in an interview, I think it was a TED Talk in Hong Kong, size that, uh, that when we were very young, you used to sit with your brother and look out of the window, and you'd look at the TV and the house next door, and you'd watch TV that day. And I thought it was fascinating. Number one, because it was due to your brother, which I thought was a wonderful, uh, it was like a painting. But number two, how in a way you were looking through a window into another person's home and might have been the beginning of, I guess, the sensitivity that you had to other people's situation and, and sharing, I guess, in, in the life of another person. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that early uh, childhood you grew up in the sky and what took you, what took you to the home eventually and what was your early life like? Um, so, I have a book people. <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to stop. I think I'm, I want to share my very sexy background story by reading a page of the book so that I think I'm smarter when I write it. Because right now I'm very nervous. There's not a lot of you. <laughs> like I didn't expect this. <laughs> so anyway, I want to start with this one. Georgia stepped out of her house quietly, catching one last glimpse of her sleeping children. She did not wake them because they might start crying and she would not have the strength to leave. Georgia traveled to Manila Airport with her husband that night. It was November 1996, with only a small bag and 20 Philippine pesos in her purse, about four cents in US dollar. Georgia was on her way to Singapore where she would become a domestic worker. <coughs> she was to stay there as a tourist while she waited for the employment agency to write fine work for her. This was illegal, but she was willing to take the risk. Two years later, Georgia left Singapore and came to Hong Kong, where she has since continued to work as a domestic helper. She saw her children once every two years when she went home on vacation. Her children grew up without a mother, and Georgia got to know them only through brief visits, phone calls, and photographs. Georgia is my This is my story. So, Georgia is my mother. This is my story, as well as the story of my mother and millions of women who have become foreign domestic workers, leaving behind their children in their home countries. Our stories have been told countless times by others, but more often than not, they only scratch the surface of our experience. This time, we will tell our own story. It's a story of love, family, and sacrifice. So, my very sa sexy background story started with my mother, and I was eight years old at that time. So, at eight, I was, um, she left me with a responsibility of being a mother to two other siblings. They were five and three. So at that time, I had a very good, 
big gap of memories. I think the one that you watch, there's a the very vivid memories that I have. Um, watching television with my brother, watching other people eat ice cream. Yeah, so basically poverty bonded us, <laughs> my brother and I. So um, my memories of childhood is very sporadic. It's not, I don't really remember a lot because I was so busy surviving and making sure that my siblings survive as well. But I was, um, in our chat, in our chat, I was fascinated by uh, a conversation we had, we talked a great deal about your mother and the influence she had on you, but you also talked about your father, Saiza, and the love that you have for him, and, um, and how he stayed behind and took care of you and your siblings. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? You had some strong feelings about that, truly a great deal of love for your father, a great deal of sacrifice took place, your mother and your father stayed behind, but it's also an unusual combination in our culture. Um, but I thought your story is... Uh, were really interesting. I don't know if you'd like to talk a little bit about that. When I was doing the book, when, you know, it took us two years to put together the book. Um, it's a collection of 2013 to 2018 images. One of my greatest fears was um, people emasculating my father. You know, because they switch roles. My mother was the one working, meanwhile my father stayed behind to take care of us. So my fear is people will see him differently, that he's not man enough to, to be able to provide for his family. So I'm, I'm scared that people will say, you know, right, mean, you know, the world can be mean, and as much as possible, I want to protect my parents from the unkindness of other people. So then I realized that I need to show the world that it takes a great man to be married to a woman who's not at his side for 26 years. Basically, they're living, one is living in the Philippines taking care of us, the other one is in Hong Kong, Singapore and Hong Kong. And my father never cheated. He, he invested the money wisely that my mother was sending us, and they're still in love. So I think it's one of the greatest love story that I've ever witnessed. Yeah. It's a very... Uh... It's a very special story now because it must mirror in many ways sides of many other family situations. Because when we hear of Filipinos uh, who go abroad, it's both women and men, and it's not just men. And so the stories like yours is being really so. And to see your perspective on it also, I think uh, gives us a whole uh, different way, I guess, of looking at human relations, the sacrifices they have to make. It goes beyond the financial uh, and political. Uh, your story is a special one. Um, but then at some point in time, I think you followed your mother to Hong Kong, uh, Saiza. Um, how did that come about and, uh, and how did photography then become a part of your life? I actually want to be a painter, but, well, I don't have the talent, unfortunately. I wasn't blessed with that. So when I was 19, uh, my siblings needs to study for a university. So you know how the typical Filipino family is, the eldest is the one who's going to sacrifice for the younger ones. So I told my mother, like, I wanna, what, why don't I follow you and work with you, you know, like, go to Hong Kong as well and work. I think one thing that I wanna specify is I chose to be a domestic worker. I, I chose that life because I'm really bored at school. The one thing that I noticed is school is not for me. Until now, like, even though I go to any university, if you put me in one room, I'm very, you know, I'm stubborn like that, so. And uh, so you, you go to Hong Kong, you work uh, together with your mother. How did photography start to become one phrase that I love, uh, I guess, in, in, in the various things I read about you is that, is that you described your mother as a person who basically lived, you know, within the confines of four walls. She worked hard, she sometimes worked seven days a week. But that you began to see Hong Kong uh, in a different light through your photography and the way you became her eyes. I thought it was such a beautiful way of expressing it. Um, how did that come about? How did you discover that passion? And how did you start discovering that component in your life? When I first arrived in Hong Kong, I, I don't have a relationship with my mother. Um, so I don't have a very good relationship with my mother because, you know, like I was eight, she left when I was eight, and uh, as a you know, growing girl, a lot of changes happened to me, and I don't have a mom with me, you know, like. 
I'm allowed to say this, but when I had, well, it's normal, when I had my first period, I thought I was dying. <laughs> because, because I don't have a much no, she's far away. So I think these little things that happened in my life where I thought I was dying, when I had my first, first crush, I don't have a mom to talk to. So our relationship is really not good. When I first arrived in Hong Kong and she is to become a mother to me, I'm like, who are you? You know, like you were away for like half of my life. So why would I, why are you trying to be a mom now? I never understand the reason why she left. I thought she left because um, she wants a better life herself. But then, um, as I, as we stayed together, as we worked together, I noticed that she never really goes out. She works seven days a week. She, her life is yeah confined in four walls. She only goes to the market and go back home. I mean, she's been in Hong Kong for twenty years, and she just learned how to use the MPR or the train last year. That's how how much sacrifice she had done. So she never really saw Hong Kong. And so I, I picked up a camera and I realized why not show it to her? You know, like because our relationship is getting better. I feel so guilty about being a bad daughter for <laughs> feeling bad. And so I decided that why not show Hong Kong through my photography. So she was the main reason that I became a photographer. I became her eye. And so what was your, what was your first camera? Uh, uh, it was uh, an SLR. You can't mention the brand. I have a contract. <laughs> <laughs> we'll accept SLR. That's okay. <laughs> I actually told, told my mother that I want to have a camera, I want to be a photographer, and she said, photography is only for rich people. That was her words. And being the stubborn child, I asked our boss, like, can you lend me some money so I can buy a camera? And fortunately, my boss is an amazing woman, so she lent me some money and then I bought a camera. So we have a lot to thank her for it because yes. she she understood that it was something meaningful to her. So those first pictures, uh, you clearly, I mean, I've seen your photographs, I've looked through them before meeting you. Um, you have a sensitivity and eye to emotional connections, the way people interact. Uh, did you always see people that way? Uh, was it was it something that then just flowed naturally to your photography, or did you begin to cultivate it as you looked around? A lot of people say that. I'm a natural, but I don't really do that. <coughs> to be honest, you know, it's not a very popular opinion. Because I think what I, how I see the world is, is a collection of the things that I consume. Like, I love reading books. I love watching movies. I'm always alone. I'm an introvert. And now I'm good at this. I got trained. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's more like when, when I was working as a domestic worker, I spend my time watching, reading, consuming other kinds of arts, types of arts. So when I started photography, I think it affected the way I see the world. And I'm always curious about other people as well. I'm, I'm an observer because I don't, I'm not a social butterfly. So as we were chatting earlier, um, um, I asked you a question expecting a very different answer. And I'd like uh, a chance for the public to hear it. Um, we're talking about the movie Roma, which of course has been highly recognized. It's black and white. Um, Alfonso Cuarón is clearly a wonderful stylist. His cinematography, which uh, he did himself, because he couldn't get access to his usual cinematographer, a friend he grew up with, so he did it himself. And I, I thought it was magnificent. And I thought I, I said I was very touched by it. But you said you were not impressed by it. And I found that opinion a very interesting one. And I thought. For those of you that have seen Roma, it might be interesting, Saiza, with your perspective, to say what were the aspects of the movie that, that didn't please you or, or that you didn't find uh, as uplifting as others did. Can we do it off the record? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, so um, I, I like Roma visually. As an artist, it's beautiful. I mean, call you a fantastic cinematographer. But, Having my own background, having lead the life of Cleo, I felt that in the movie she was voiceless. 
key is voices. Have you ever heard of like see one paragraph? I, I also felt that it was a movie in the perspective of someone who's privileged. Cleo became a background to a movie that's supposed to be about her. I mean, that's a very personal opinion. I don't have any opinion about the visuals. I think it's fantastic, it's beautiful, Korean is the best among the, you know, but personally, it's how I saw the movie. I was yawning at the middle. I, I think that's a fascinating perspective uh, because most people who view it will not have your perspective. And so for you to see it that way, I think is an interesting new juxtaposition. I do agree with you uh, that uh, for the cinema, the graphic point of view is really quite stunning. But you're bringing out an aspect of it that probably most people can relate to, and you clearly do. Which takes me, I guess, to, to another topic of your photography. You started taking photographs, and of course I don't know you in the size of that. I've just seen an evolution that's taken place where you've added more and more layers of uh, social understanding, social commentary to the pictures that you take. Um, you must have had a strong visual eye and an understanding of human beings and how they connect. But I've noticed you started to write articles and you started to express yourself in different ways. I was fascinated when you told me when, when Hong Kong went through its great difficulty and you had riots on the street in recent times, that you attended all the 79 days of those protests. I thought that was extraordinary. And so there must be more layers that you're adding to this uh, beyond, I guess, the photography itself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And by the way, you write extremely well. Uh, for those of you, so there are other elements, I guess, that you're bringing to the equation. That transition from photography, seeing people, and then beginning to see them within the context, I guess, of a social situation. Are there elements there that began to dawn on you, or they, they were almost there? I think with my practice as a photographer, I try to ask a lot of whys, you know, like why is it happening? I don't think, I don't think things just like that. I need to know why is it happening because context is king. You know, everything that we do in life, there's a reason for it. And so as a photographer, I try to find that reason why it is happening. Because if you know the why, then the house will be easier. Right? Like, if we can answer these questions, then maybe we can find solutions to these problems. So that's how my practice as a documentary photographer is, the curiosity. Uh, I think that's maybe why this, we will feel a connection to your photography, because there's a substance there beyond the image. And I think maybe uh, uh, it's something that you're picking up as you take the photographs, and it's clearly visible. I started to read your articles in, in Indonesia, all plantations there, and you have an eye that, that, that's very particular. But that brings me maybe to one last issue before you go to your photography, which I was fascinated with, um, and uh, that is your visit to Marawi. Uh, Marawi is a part of the country that means a great deal to us, yet so many of us feel so distant and everything that's happening there. I think it might be interesting for everyone to hear a little bit about your own thoughts, the kind of people that you met, the feelings that you had, and, um, and you know, I had the good fortune of seeing a drone shot, so uh, size is moving on to drone photography as well as just uh, uh, normal black and white photography. But maybe your own insights on, on that trip because you've been there quite a few times now. So I had I have this project. I think I've shown it with Bambina last time when I had a talk here. It's called Education as a Weapon. Um, it's not done yet, but I've already gathered all the materials. So Education as a Weapon because I believe that education can empower children or people but it can also be a weapon that can be used when it's not regulated properly. It can be used to radicalize children. So it, I've, I've been doing the project since 2015. I've been in and out of Mindanao. I actually stay more there than here in Lila. <laughs> so uh, I have a very fortunate um, relationship with the people there. They welcome me into their homes. I think the reason why I keep on doing this is because I want to show to the people of the north that there's more to Mindanao. It's beautiful. The people are wonderful. Abu Sayyaf, those terrorist acts that has been done doesn't represent Mindanao. There's more to it. And it's very sad when I, I hear people think of Mindanao and relate it to 
you know, undesirable people. Is that the right one? I feel like I'm going for a little bit more of a Anyway, you know, like with, 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 with people who are doing bad things, it doesn't make the whole win them out. It, it's such a beautiful place. They have wonderful people, and there are things that work together. It's not just about religion. Thank you, Saiza. I think this might be a good time to, to move a little bit uh, to your photography. You had a video that you wanted to show us first, uh, Saiza? Yeah, so I have a video there. Is someone who's going to press the play button? Yes. Thank you. So uh, this, is, this video is a conversation between my mother and my youngest. I'm supposed to be joined in a Christmas party for the school from Mabam New website. Ako ay isang domestic worker dito sa Hong for 20 years. Nag-abot ako kasi sobrang hirap na buhay namin noon. Pagkagaling ng asawa ko si Pilar Moore sa Saudi, ako naman ang umalis. Wala pa rin bahay at ako ang lagandiya ng bayan. Gusto kong bigyan ng mas maayos na buhay yung mga anak ko. At iniwan ko sila nung mga bata pa sila. Hindi ko sila nakita ng mabagi. Nakakausap ko lang sila nung sa sulat. Bihira ang ligado dahil mahal ang kamera. Mas maayos kayo at may internet at Facebook. Nakikita ko yung mga ako kong rumaki kahit sa serpon lang. Mas pwede ako sa ako kong si Mrs. Ruby. Mabait ang mga pamilya nila. Tinuroan niya akong magsalita ng kantonis. Sinato niya akong tao. Sa pagkakos sa kanila, kilala na namin ang isang isa. Sobrang napaka-generous niya sa akin at sa pamilya niya ko. Kaya napamahal na siya sa akin. Minsan nga inisip ko, paano ko na kaya pag-uuli ako? Parang hindi ko siya maliwan. Kaya inisip ko, isang mga naman kaya siya sa Pilipinas. Pagtanda siya talaga ako siya. Mahila na mong maging tayo. Kaya isang matalaga pero kailangan mahalin ang trabaho kasi mas mahirap sa Pilipinas. Hindi ako nagsisisi na umalis at nagpunta dito sa Hong Kong kasi naiarap ko yung pamilya ko. Siguro kung hindi ako umalis, baka may TV na ako ngayon sa pagkarabahan na Siyempre, nangyemis ko ang asawa ko araw-araw. Ilang, ilang taon na yung kami na long distance. Mahigit. 22 years. Sanay na siguro kami na malayo sa isang isa. Maswerte ako sa asawa ko kasi hindi nagro ko. Nag-focus siya sa pamilya namin at hindi Yes, ano, marunong bawa ng pera. Mahihirap lang kayo ang anak na walang ima, pero kailangan ang sacrificio. Hindi alam na mga anak ko noon kung anong nangyayari sa akin sa akin. Gusto ko kasi sila protektahan at mag-focus sa mag-aaral. Ang gusto ko, Gusto ko lang magkaroon sila ng mga ng buhay. Sana ngayong lalaki na sila, maiintindihan na nila kung bakit kailangan kong umalis. Kung pwede lang sana bumalik sa dati, kung pwede lang bumalik sa nakaraan, sana uh, hihilingin ko na sana hindi na lang siya mag-abroad. Or mag-abroad para kahit pa paano, habang lumalaki ako noon, nung bata ako, kasama ko siya. Hindi kayang palitan ng pera yung presence ni Mama. 
mas okay pa rin sana na kahit ipit na kahit may hirapan, basta yung importante nandito siya. Kung bata ako sa tuwing umuwi siya, lagi ko siyang tinatanong kung aalis pa ba siya, at lagi nga kung sinasagot na oo daw, lagi, lagi ko naman siyang tinatanong bakit pa siya aalis. Ang lagi naman niyang sinasagot sa akin, kailangan daw para magkaroon kami ng aking bahay, para magbili namin lahat ng gusto namin, para magkaroon na kami ng magandang future. Lagi ko naman siya sabi sa kanya na hindi ko naman kailangan ng aking bahay, ng maraming gamit, ng maraming pera. Ang gusto ko siya kasi ang hirap ng sitwasyon na lumalaki ako na wala siya, na yung papa ko lang yung kasama ko. Nandun, nandun siya sa trabaho, yung pakiramdam na mag-isa ko lang. <laughs> Pero nung kinuha niya yung sister ko na nag-aalaga sa akin, doon na ako nagsimulang mag-rebelde. Na parang pakiramdam ko nun mag-isa na lang ako, na nainiwan na nila ako dahil pakiramdam ko, kulang ko. Pakiramdam ko wala akong pamilya. Gusto ko na sana umuwi si Mama para makapagpahinga na rin siya, para ma-enjoy na rin niya yung buhay niya, para makasama niya na rin si Papa at mga bata. So, most beautiful size is you give your mother a voice. And uh, unlike, I guess, Alfonso Cuarón, I have to see the movie in a completely different eyes, you gave her a voice. And, in a very young age, uh, it's uh, extraordinary. Um, maybe if it's okay, Saiza, maybe we open up. Uh, there are a lot of people who came here to listen to you today. This is a bigger crowd as I've seen uh, at this gathering. And uh, maybe, Kara, uh, if it's okay, maybe we'll open the floor up to allow people to ask questions of uh, uh, Saiza at this point in time. Sounds great. Isabella. Wait, here comes Bambina with the other mic. <laughs> <laughs> You speak very good English, and yet at the age of eight you stay home to take care of your siblings. <coughs> did you finish high school and did you go to college? I finished high school. I went to uh, university for two years. Also, I speak five languages. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I speak Cantonese. Really good. So you have a, you have a facility for languages. Yeah, I think it came from um, from the the being part of the indigenous groups because we speak Ilocano, then our local dialect, then English and Tagalog, then Cantonese, and a little bit of Picolano here and there. <laughs> Thank you. All these layers of exercise that keep coming up. Other questions? I think uh, at the back of the room. Main top ten countries who would like to go to, to photograph what is happening there. If you had like a limited budget, where would you go? What countries would you focus on? Unlimited budget. It's my dream. Well, my top country would be Philippines because I think we have a lot of stories that the world needs to see. Second one is, um, I'm very fascinated with the Arab world. Um, actually, I have a project in, in the Gulf areas. Uh, the third one is, um, I only have five. I mean, um, Indonesia. I want to go back to Indonesia. It's a wonderful place. Um, the next one is, of course, I want to go to, um, I think right now I'm very fascinated with America, the US. I think um, there's a lot of stories there right now that we need to, you know, know. And mostly Asia. I think it's time that Asians, we tell our stories to the world. You know, it's our time to be able to tell our own stories. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of your photography? So you said you purchased your first camera. So when did you go out and you said, you, you also initially said you wanted to take photos for your mother. But when you first started going out into the city, 
what caught your eye and how did it become that process of the pictures that you that uh, proceeded to take and how did it get recognized? How did it become uh, uh, how did it become aware of it? I um, I started with street photography. I, I was I'm always fascinated with I have a series called Isolation of the Soul. I I felt so lonely in Hong Kong. I was 19 when I was when I went there first. So it's only me and my camera. So I was going out and I'm always fascinated with people who are actually alone. I mean Hong Kong is a very condensed city. So to find these people, to find someone alone against the backdrop of the big buildings is fascinating for me. Like again, it's like what were they thinking? Like, why are you lonely? Why are you sad? So I have all these questions with me. And then another um, project that I keep on doing for myself is the Love and Poetry series. I changed it to Warm Bodies. The title of Warm Bodies, I think, says here. Anyway, so um, the Love and Poetry project is because I write poetry as well. Not so good. It's a kind of like Insta poetry. You can read on Instagram. So um, I'm fascinated by how people actually can love another person. Like, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how I'm, I'm fascinated that they were able to show their love in public. And I don't understand romance. I don't understand how people or you know human beings can actually love another person that are that is not biologically, you know. You know, it's not like there's nothing there, but only love. So I'm very fascinated by, by that. So I've been doing that project for since 2012 to now. And um, the reason why I mentioned those two projects is because as I develop as a person, as a photographer, I realize that couples who does all this public display of affection are actually isolating themselves away from the public. It's a way of being lonely, but this time they're alone with someone else. And I think that's a beautiful contrast with my isolation of the soul. So as I develop my, my practice as a photographer, I think my curiosity about how, you know, all the whys, all the questions, like, <laughs> I, I have all this question and it always guides me with my, my photographs. I think what comes out a lot, uh, size of whenever you talk and even in the conversation we had before coming here, is this innate curiosity. And, um, and I'm fascinated by it because you're constantly asking questions and it comes out in photography. You get into a deeper layer into the questions you ask. Um, the issue of curiosity and the issue of asking questions as part of the artistic process, do you feel it's a fundamental, fundamental strength that brought out deeper layer, I guess, in your photography, and, and how did that curiosity come about? As a young kid, were you always curious? Uh, um, what is it about people, curiosity about people, about situations? Uh, was it general curiosity? Uh, because it's such a strong component of the reasoning that you give for your willing to, your uh, need to understand situations. I think um, it's, you know, I was, well, my mom always said I was a terrible baby because I always cry. Like I'm awake at night time and I'm sleeping at daytime. And when I was a child, I'm always asking people questions. So I think it came, uh, it, as I grew up, it developed. And also one thing is because I was on the side of the spectrum. I was someone in 2014 where everyone was trying to tell my story. And I think a lot of those stories were wrong because they have this certain narrative that she should be this, she should be that. And they never, that's why I have a very strong opinion about Roma. Yes. Because I felt that, that people like me, especially people of color, we are not seen. People don't ask us what we need. There's always people telling us what we need. And I think it's important for me as a documentary photographer, to ask questions because I know the feeling when people don't ask me questions, when people decide for me. Yes. Yeah. That's a very powerful response. Okay. Yeah, perfect segue from, from what you just said, uh, uh, Did you find that?
recognition for your art and your talent. Was harder to come by from your Filipino compatriots, and that I think is also a lesson for our society to look into. Why do we tend to box people in a certain way and not allow them to have their own voice and perhaps transcend, which you have done? Um, yeah, I think just being a former domestic worker alone, people just put me in the box. Like, she should just be doing migrant stories because she's a migrant. And I think that's wrong. And when it comes to recognition, I find it really sad that it's so hard for me to come home in the Philippines. I, I have that itch right now. Like, I need to do more stories in the Philippines because I'm a Filipino, you know? Like, I find it sad that I need to be awesome outside first before people even started recognizing the words that I do here. I, I don't care, I don't really care about recognition. My mother never cares about that. I'm like, if I say, oh, ma, I'm on 100 BBC Women of the World, I'm just like, did they pay you? <laughs> She's always like that. So for me, recognitions are just, it's not that important, but it's important that we pave the way for creatives, for artists, for Filipinos to dream that there's more, you know, that, they're, that they will be able to create, they will be able to be someone else in their own country, that they don't need to go out just to be recognized. So I think that's my, you know, that's my point. Um, while others are putting up their hands, uh, says, uh, clearly um, people have also been kindly. Uh, you mentioned the first time you received. Um, have people generally have you received help and kindness from many uh, uh, unusual sources? And I'm curious about that because uh, I'm a great believer that I think one should help in that whatever one can. And, and if you create a culture of helping, somehow things come back to you. Did you have any experience of that kind in, in your own um, upbringing or in you know, situations you found yourself in? My, my father always says, always um, mentioned this to us, even though we're all grown ups. You should always help other people, even though you don't have anything, because you don't want to be in a position where you're asking for help. So you want to be that someone who's opening doors rather than someone who's shutting doors. So, we might. Jordi, as a photographer, I'm very, very grateful to all the people that helped me. Like, I got discovered on Facebook. Can you imagine that? Facebook is evil, but... <laughs> <laughs> Someone saw my works on Facebook, and they were like, okay, let's send your work in New York Times, Rick Cora, and then it started, it started rolling from there. So I think what everyone of us can do is Try to be kind because it doesn't hurt. You don't know, you'll never know that one person that you saw on Facebook who had a wonderful word, you send it to someone like, hey, I saw this word, then that person will be, you know, will be someone else. So just keep the ball rolling, the ball of kindness rolling, yeah. Thank you. I think there's some questions again. Hi, so first off, before I ask my question, I'd just like to say that as a young woman who is similarly interested in the digital arts, I think that you are such an amazing example um, and such a great source of inspiration because you're humorous, you're outspoken, and you're obviously very talented and intelligent. So thank you for being who you are. Um, my question for you, I'm interested to see from your perspective, since photography is basically um, singular moments out of reality, what do you think makes a moment worth capturing? For me, personally, if it makes me happy, or if it makes me feel something, I always shoot with feelings. Like, if you look at my face, I have this resting bitch face. <laughs> so, if, like, if you look at my face when I'm not talking, I, people say, you're like a stone or something. But for me, when I shoot with feelings, I always go with the guts. Like, if I know that photo will make me really happy, then I will take that photo. I think with photography, you should really love the craft. You don't... I mean, if I can say something to younger generations, not caring what other people would say. 
you need to do it because you love doing it. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, yes, thank you for sharing your inspiring story. I'm, I'm hoping to see more of the work. I don't know if it's in the cards to see it on, on the screen, but I'm hoping at least that you'll speak to um, the work in terms of themes. You talked about isolation of the soul. Is that a show? Is that something that runs through all your work? Yeah, how is that a book? Uh, what takes you to Indonesia versus Dubai or Philippines? How, how do you categorize your body of work? It's about 10 years old now, your body of work, right? You can talk to that. So in the documentary world, I'm very interested in the intersections of migration and human rights. That's why we have a book called We Are Like Air. This is my first book. It's We Are Like Air because I, I believe that migrant Migrants are like air, important necessity in every city, but unseen. We don't see them. The, the labor is unseen, and it's like air. If you don't have air, you'll die. So, the main um, in my in documentary works, my main body of work is migration because I'm a migrant worker. I'm in a very privileged position to tell our story. Meanwhile, with the other stories that I I, I do. It's out of more like, um, for example, in Indonesia, it's related to climate change. Because um, I started asking about climate change because it's so hot. <laughs> I had feelings. So, I was, so a lot of these works are supported by, by other people. And I think it's more like, I always ask myself this, why do I care about this issue? So if I can answer that question myself, I'll do the project. If I cannot answer it, I'm not gonna, even going to touch it. Because it takes a lot of time and work to do one documentary project, like the one in Vietnam, it's now on its fourth year. And uh, with the artsy-fartsy world, <laughs> it depends what the market wants, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's more like, it, you know, I, I still don't understand the art, art world, but I, it's more like, I just put it out, it depends on how you see it. I think that's the beauty of the art world. It's what you see, it's not what I see. I'm just presenting you something. Yeah. Um, aside from your photography, uh, are there other forms of art that you're seeking to develop size that I, I for example, uh, you started off as a photographer, but you write very well, and you have a sensitivity, the same sensitivity that you have for photography, you're beginning to express in the written form. Do uh, you see an evolution in, in your art world? Do you see it spreading to new ways or are you experimenting with new ideas? I'm experimenting in ways to present photographs. I think um, I love doing installations now. So I, I'll have a show in New York this coming May where I'm doing a, lots of installation. And well, we're already here and some of you might want to fund it. <laughs> so I'm I, I did the last show on, you know, the, the Nazarene yes. last January, and I'm fascinated by it. It was photographed a hundred times, but it was the first thousand times for other photographers, but it was the first time that I went there, and I saw the strength of the Filipinos in numbers. But my take was, where are the goddesses? Where are the women? It's, you know, it's very male-dominated, and if you go to the parade, the women saints are actually at the back. It's always about the men in front. So I did this body of work called Escapism. It's now being shown in Art Tokyo. And I really want to do this project next year where we bring the parade outside of Kiapo and let other people experience it. Like, you know, those big installations, like rooms, where you can go in and it's going to be a moving image. I, it's beautiful in my brain. I don't know if it's beautiful now. That's coming up in, you know, <laughs> that I'm trying to explain it. So I want to do that in the Philippines by next year. My question might be um, very sensitive. You were very fortunate and blessed that your family stayed together when your mother went abroad and that you were able to reconnect with your mother. Having myself been abroad for many years and having seen the FOFWs, domestic workers abroad, where families do not make it. For every 
one that makes it, the other one blows apart. Which saddens me immensely, being very close to the Filipino community abroad. And sometimes I really wonder whether the sacrifice that the person takes going abroad, it's worth for what happens afterwards, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road when there is no relationship between the children and, and the mother or the father and uh, sometimes the money is not invested wisely back home and when I see, um, I live in Monaco so I see children from the Philippines asking, you know, for Christmas very expensive Nike shoes and the domestic worker in Monaco has to work 100 hours sometimes to pay for these shoes to send them home they don't realize the sacrifice it takes at the other end. And this enabling sometimes, it's because it becomes a way of enabling if the person back home is not fully aware of the sacrifice. How do you feel about that? I mean, is it worth it? No. For me, it's a no. Because being a child of a migrant domestic worker and having to work as a domestic worker myself, I have a lot of issues. I have a lot of things that I need to work on by, with myself. Like, I'm very big on talking about mental health issues because exactly. yeah. we now have two generations of children who were left behind by 10 million Filipinos. As they say, a child to be able to thrive in his, her adulthood. They need love, they need education, they, they need food, they need affection. It's, it's like the four most basic things that a child needs. And if we're not able to give affection to these children, what's the future of the Philippines? I mean, no mother should ever leave their children behind. And when it comes to those expensive things, I'm always advocating to my fellow migrant workers, you need to tell the truth to your children. What's happening, you need to be very honest, especially in the age of social media, that where everyone can take a photo in a Chanel store and take photos of the really good food that they make for the employers and post it on Facebook. But the reality is they're not eating those food. So the families back home have this idea that Oh my God, my, my mother, my, my father is actually having a good time. I should ask for more money. So that's the reality. But it's the dysfunctionality that then, as you say, two generations down, it, you know, it perpetuates and goes on and on and on. Yeah, thank you very much for your honesty. We have time for one more question. I saw it was a very inspiring story. Um, I would just like to ask, because we have a lot of um, struggling photographers here in the Philippines. It's, it's an industry that's very hard to, to succeed in. And because we get a lot of freelance jobs and stuff like that, it's not reliable. You know? It's not like, oh, we'll eat tomorrow like the way we ate yesterday. So um, I guess my question is, in your case, um, when did you realize that your passion is turning into something else? that your passion is way bigger than you expected or planned it to be? Is there any defining moment? The most defining moment is when I got fired from my job. <laughs> <laughs> Which job was that? <laughs> they fired me, so I was like, I have no choice. <laughs> I got the Magnum Foundation Fellowship. It was on the papers, internet. I did not tell my employer, Mrs. Louie. So she read it on the papers. <laughs> and immediately came home and talked to me. She was like, why you never tell me? And I told her that, well, I don't know if I'm gonna go. I mean, so snobbish, you know? <laughs> and what you fish? I have a reason for that. My reason is, I'm scared that I will not be able to help my family anymore. So I was like, I don't really want to go. And then she said, well, you're fired. You need to go because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So let's go.
once uh, with which to finish this. Uh, Sainza, I think on behalf of all of us here, uh, let me congratulate you for your sensitivity, uh, for your frankness, for your curiosity, uh, boundless curiosity for your love of family, for your respect for people, for your pride in yourself, and for your pride in your country. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, unfortunately, we're supposed to bring 50 books, but, you know, days, whatever. So, if you want to buy the book, just leave your contact and we're just going to deliver it to you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.